melatonin fuels the synthesis of many different phytochemicals like glucosinolates. So it's in plants, it's in animals, and it's in people. It's everywhere. The gut produces something on the order of 100 to 400 times the melatonin that's produced by the pineal gland. Melatonin is seen as a mitochondrial regulator in the way of a few different things. One is autophagy or mitophagy. So in other words, cleanup of the mitochondria. Well, the other function as it relates to the mitochondria that you already spoke to actually, is its role as an antioxidant. But it's not just any old antioxidant. You know, that's such a 1990s word. If people have light colored eyes, that is uh, another way to be looking at how we can change our melatonin status because people with light eyes, so light green, light blue, even light brown, if they're exposed to light at night, they can be more susceptible to the suppression of melatonin synthesis. This is Decentralized Radio. I'm Tristan. And I'm Ryan. The goal of this podcast is to help educate you on how to live your most optimal life. We will host industry expert guests to shed light on topics that matter. We are not gurus, rather two individuals who have had to pave their own path to health and vitality, independent of the centralized systems that plague modern society. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Decentralized Radio. Today, we have Dr. Deanna Minnick on the line. We're going to talk all about melatonin. Really excited for this podcast episode. We have Ryan on the line. Deanna, how's it going today? Thanks for joining. Hi, so good to be here with you talking about one of my favorite topics of melatonin. Yeah, yeah. This is something, I think it was early last year, I started really diving down the rabbit hole, reading uh, Scott Zimmerman, Russell Reiter's research. Hmm. And then I saw your new paper that came out maybe a few months ago and definitely um, was really intrigued. I actually think someone sent it to me on Twitter and it's it's really fascinating how much people know about melatonin in terms of they know it's like, uh, you know, for sleep, but then how little they know about everything else. Like it's probably, it's one of those compounds I think that is like a household name, but people are missing like 99% of the picture. But yeah, maybe before we get into that, I guess, what, what is your background? How did you kind of evolve into more of this alternative, you know, thinking? Cause it really is, outside of the box and traditional centralized medicine is is not really talking about a lot of stuff like that. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. They're, they're not seeing the great big hole. And even now, there's a lot of polarity around melatonin. And I think it comes from not having a full understanding. So the way that I got to this, so I have a PhD in medical science. I have a master's in human nutrition and metabolism. So my background is in nutrition. And I'm a classic researcher in the way of looking at nutrients. So melatonin did not even hit my radar until the pandemic. I started doing all of this research on the immune system and nutrient modulation. And as I was reading the articles, I would see, oh, there's talk about zinc and vitamin D, vitamin C and quercetin, some of the likely suspects, but tossed into that blend was also melatonin. And I was thinking, wait a minute, I don't know that much about melatonin as it relates to the immune system regulation. So I started to go down the rabbit hole of looking into how melatonin was changing the immune system. And then that led me down into looking at how melatonin, I would say, is actually a circadian nutrient. And that was the position that we took in the paper that was published in the Nutrients Journal in September of 2022. We looked at melatonin vis-a-vis -vis vitamin D and how they're kind of like two sides of the same coin. So I further got into melatonin because I was exploring it. And then I came onto a company by the name of Symphony Natural Health. And I started working with them, doing some consulting work and looking into their plant melatonin. So it did lead me into greater depth as it relates to melatonin. And I continue to watch the science and listen to people's responses, anecdotal. I'm learning actually something about melatonin. I feel like almost every day because people let me know like, oh my gosh, I tried it and this is what happened. It's like, wow, I don't see that in the literature. 
But if we understand the mechanisms and if we think like a scientist, we can understand how melatonin can truly have an impact. So maybe we'll get into that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe we just start out from the top, you know, let's talk about melatonin at a high level. What what is it doing in our body? What are the various types or where it's produced cuz there's there's a lot to unravel here and yeah, maybe let's lay a foundation and then kind of build on top of that and go a little deeper. Yeah. Great. So first of all, melatonin is not new. In fact, uh, you're familiar with Dr. Ryder's work. He had published a book on melatonin back in the 1990s. And Dr. Andrew Weil had written, um, you know, an endorsement for the book. I mean, people have known about melatonin. It's not new to the scene. It's actually ancient. And I would say that it evolved during, um, you know, if we look at single-celled organisms and the development of things like the mitochondria. So when you think of melatonin, think of the mitochondria. So as the species started to evolve and become much more complex in metabolism, we started to see more of that melatonin concentration within cells. And even within the plant kingdom, it's kind of interesting, this just as a little tidbit, melatonin fuels the synthesis of many different phytochemicals like glucosinolates. So it's in plants, it's in animals, and it's in people, it's everywhere. So when we look at melatonin as the name, so mela refers to the skin. So it was actually discovered by a dermatologist back in 1958. And the mela refers to the melanin in the skin because he thought it was a skin lightening agent. The tonin, refers to its chemical structure, which is very similar to serotonin. In fact, the way that we get melatonin in our bodies is to convert tryptophan, which is an amino acid, to serotonin, to melatonin. Now, there are a lot of enzymes and a lot of nutrients required for that conversion, and it's not always efficient. And sometimes our body needs tryptophan for other things, so we don't always get the full amount of melatonin. So your other part of the question was, where is it found? Um, if we think of the human body, when most people think of melatonin these days, they think of it for sleep. And I would say that sleep is just one little fraction of melatonin. The type of melatonin, so first of all, the, the type of melatonin in our bodies is chemically the same, but it is produced in different tissues for different functions, I would say. So the, the type that people think of as it relates to sleep is the, the pineal gland created melatonin. So that only happens at night. That happens in response to darkness. So we get a peak. It's almost like we flatline in our pineal gland melatonin throughout the whole day. Then we go to bed. And then between 2 and 4 a.m., we spike in that melatonin produced by the pineal gland. And when it's produced by the pineal gland, what happens is it it circulates systemically and it keys into receptors throughout the body on different cells and gets the cells synchronized. So the clock genes, the, the circadian rhythm. So that more than anything else is what melatonin from the pineal gland is about. It's about keeping you in line with day night rhythm. Now, by way of thinking about that though, and we're learning a lot more about its brain effects when we see that spike between 2 and 4 a.m., we also see a spike in things like glutathione, superoxide dismutase, different other types of antioxidant defense enzymes. And that's kind of interesting because if you think of sleep, one of its functions is restoration. And part of the way that we do that, we have that resetting of the immune system. We have the resetting of the brain through the lymphatic fluid. There's a lot of antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activity that's actually happening at night. And what we're starting to see is kind of like the next level of melatonin from the pineal gland is its connection to those functions. The second organ that produces a lot of melatonin, but not in response to darkness, is the gut. In fact, the gut produces something on the order of 100 to 400 times the melatonin that's produced by the pineal gland. So we think that it, there are different functions of melatonin depending on where it's produced and how it's signaled. And what we know and think about the gut-derived melatonin is that it's more of a local effect. So it has more of an autocrine or a paracrine effect 
Whereas the pineal gland melatonin is more of an endocrine, a systemic effect. So, but, you know, it's produced throughout the body. You know, there, there's pretty much no organ system. It would be hard to think of an organ system that wouldn't have melatonin. But typically I think of the brain, the eyes. The eyes are a big, we're going to talk about the eyes today. Um, obviously the skin, that's where it was first, you know, if we look at the identification of um, you know, hormones and skin. The skin is a huge landscape of hormones, especially melatonin. And so is vitamin D. You know, vitamin D is connected on in the liver, the kidney, the thyroid, thymus, the skeletal muscle, you know, even the ovaries, the reproductive system, and all of the fluids of the body from saliva to urine, the cerebral spinal fluid, also, um, you know, just thinking about breast milk. And so infants, when they are nursed, First, and they are they receive breast milk, they're actually getting melatonin from the mother, which helps to prime potentially what we see from animal studies. It helps to prime the gut microbiome very early in life. This podcast is brought to you by our lead sponsor, EMR Tech. EMR Tech manufactures high quality, high powered red light therapy devices. In my opinion, red and infrared light are two of the biggest nutrient deficiencies in our modern society due to our indoor lifestyles. Red light therapy devices like the ones from EMR Tech can help combat that by providing high powered red light while being indoors. I personally use mine every morning and every evening. Red and near infrared light is extremely beneficial for energy production in our body because it boosts mitochondrial function and penetrates deep into the cell. It is also extremely beneficial for skin health, eye health, as well as our circadian rhythms. And this is actually pretty much why I bought everyone in my family an EMR Tech red light therapy device for Christmas. EMR Tech panels are low flicker, low EMF, and use targeted wavelengths such as 830 and 630 nanometers, amongst others, to get extremely effective results. For more information, go to emrtech.com and use our code DRADIO10 for 10% off your order. That's emrtek.com with our code DRADIO, D-R-A-D-I-O, 10 to save at checkout. Very cool. I'll stop oh, there. There's a lot. To, no, to we could, I'd, I'd totally let you keep going. That's awesome. I mean, <laughs> it's it, like you said at the beginning of the podcast, um, we're learning, like you said, more about melatonin every single day. And it's so pervasive. Yeah. It's really like this master antioxidant that completely uh, takes over and, and maintains and really is key and critical to our overall well-being. And so what you said, what was really interesting is like, it's found everywhere. Like in the gut mucosa, I found that part really fascinating. The fact that it's making like 100 to 400 times. When I first read that probably six months ago or something like that, or maybe it was more recent, um, I was like blown away. And the fact that um, it's made within the mitochondria, a lot of people that'll come to me and ask about melatonin, think of it as a pineal gland first uh, hormone. And it's not necessarily, it's like all over the place. And so everyone's focused on, well, not everyone, but a lot of people get focused on pineal uh, calcification and how can I, you know, help with that to improve melatonin when it's like so much deeper. One thing I wanted to sort of pry and maybe we can get into because we talk a lot about mitochondrial health and I found it to be very important for my own well-being uh, just as a systemic root cause of problems that I've had with myself, but also clients I've worked with, family members. What happens when mitochondria begin to fail? How does melatonin tie with that? And maybe this is where we get into some stuff about the eye too. Um, because it is sort of, like you said, it has that circadian rhythm, you know, component. Um, why is that important? And I, I, there's a lot of ways we mess that up nowadays, but I'd love yeah. to get into sort of the mitochondrial component of melatonin and how mitochondrial dysfunction and those things play together and can create disease. Because I find melatonin is a problem in, in most chronic health conditions. Like my, I had a boss that had terminal cancer um, mm -hmm. and he was supplementing like super heavy melatonin. And you find that people that often have chronic health conditions also aren't sleeping. And usually the sleeping might have preceded the illness. And so all these things kind of, you see the dominoes fall. I'd love to get into that with you. Yeah, okay, so let's go down the rabbit hole of the mitochondria as it meets melatonin. That's what I'm taking from your question. And there are a lot of different directions there. First of all, um, Melatonin is seen as a mitochondrial regulator in the way of a few different things. One is autophagy or mitophagy. So in other words, cleanup of the mitochondria. 
So one of the reasons behind aging and Deepak Chopra and so many other people talk about this, right? It's like the science of autophagy that we don't have good cleanup of cellular debris. And it seems that what melatonin is able to do is to help in that metabolic process of clearance. So again, back to detoxification, because one of the things that really jams up the mitochondria is toxicants, just toxins in general, whether it's heavy metals, plastics, uh, xenoestrogens. And so as a result of that infiltration of those different toxicants, we get this dysfunction of the mitochondria. Those are mitochondrial poisons. And what we see now, this is, I would say, emerging work on melatonin, that we see it may also play a role in detoxification of a number of those different contaminants. So there's that. Now, the other function as it relates to the mitochondria that you already spoke to, actually, is its role as an antioxidant. But it's not just any old antioxidant. You know, that's such a 1990s word. And, you know, I think we what we started to do in nutrition science is we just started to bucket all of these nutrients and just say, oh, they're just antioxidants. Well, melatonin is a little bit different. Uh, first of all, it's amphiphilic. So what does that mean? It means that it can traverse through the fat soluble tissues and the water soluble medium of the body. So it can go in the blood, it can be in the brain. And some of the other antioxidants can't do that. So in other words, it's very flexible. In fact, there was a study, I think it was by Dr. Tan, in which he, it, it was a beautiful article because he actually showed how one molecule of melatonin gets metabolized into a number of different metabolites and they all have antioxidant capacity. So one molecule of melatonin can scavenge up to 10 free radicals. And just for comparison's sake, you know, like vitamin C, I remember reading can scavenge up to like one to two free radicals. So, you know, just if we think of melatonin doing, you know, so many more times that, so it's not to say that it's all about melatonin because I think melatonin can work well with other antioxidants, but it does seem to exhibit some superiority in terms of its free radical scavenging. And we're gonna talk about this again when we talk about synthetic melatonin and plant melatonin, because it seems that plant melatonin can scavenge free radicals even better than the synthetic type of melatonin that's out there. So I just, you know, when we think of mitochondria, think of detoxification, think of metabolism, think of oxidative stress and inflammation. These are all of the things that age us. And that's why so many people are keen on taking melatonin as a biohacking or a longevity strategy, because it's actually helping to regulate those processes at the center stage of the cell where a lot of that is happening within the mitochondria. Yeah, I mean, I think the listeners to this show know just how important the mitochondria is. And to me, I've written about melatonin. I almost call it like the composer of the mitochondria. And this whole antioxidant theory that, you know, you stated, right, it goes back decades that, oh, if we just take more antioxidants, we reduce oxidative stress and it's just really easy. But then you get into things that, you know, show that most of the dietary antioxidants don't really get into the cell. They don't really work as well as these endogenous uh, antioxidants, as you mentioned, melatonin, glutathione, superoxide, dismutase. So I think that's really important to highlight for people. But getting into kind of the specifics, because this is something I've been wondering about since I've read, you know, writer's work and Zimmerman's work talking about how exactly is the mitochondria, you know, producing or synthesizing melatonin? And I know obviously near infrared light plays a, a big role into that. And is this happening during the day? Is this happening kind of all the time? What's, uh, I guess, your take? And maybe you could explain that a little bit better. Yeah, I think what that speaks to, like this whole um, aspect of uh, photobiomodulation or looking at red light, I think we can stimulate the skin to create more efficient mitochondria and actually help in the metabolic pathways and even looking at melatonin. But what we're not doing with those kinds of therapies per se is changing the pineal gland um, derived melatonin, right? Because again, if we're thinking of the body and systems and segments, there is different 
um, I would say different reasons to have melatonin in different tissues. So I think red light therapy and looking at the production of melatonin and creating mitochondrial efficiency can be seen with the skin, but I don't know of research where we actually see changes in the pineal gland. I mean, maybe I just haven't seen it, but again, um, the pineal gland responds to darkness. And in the paper that you both referred to that we wrote a year ago now, uh, it was really about looking at darkness deficiency because this whole aspect of the quantum, right? Like looking at our relationship to light and darkness. And I think what happened, especially with the pandemic is people got really cued into vitamin D through their skin, through light, but we didn't look so much at darkness. And I would propose, and we pr proposed in the article actually, that people have a darkness deficiency that we are on artificial blue light devices late at night. And this is, in my opinion, these are my words, um, I believe that artificial light at night is the most societally accepted endocrine disruptor. You know, most people know about plastics, they know about metals, they think of the, the toxicity of those things, but they don't think of artificial light at night as being a very potent disruptor. And it's not just our melatonin synthesis endogenously. It's also changing thyroid, glucocorticoids, reproductive hormones, because this is a track within the body that is interdependent. So if we're changing melatonin or stress hormones, um, you know, we're changing essentially the circuit. So I do think that looking at light as you're proposing by way of looking at the mitochondria, um, you know, that's definitely one interface, but really the eyes, the eyes are really essential um, in this whole process of bringing in melatonin. So when we're thinking about light recommendations, I don't know about both of you, but I have an app on my phone and I use this app, like the way I do it with my phone is I just basically use the camera to be at eye level. I turn on the app, which is called Light Meter. It's a free app. You probably have it or something like it, right? So you just kind of assess your environment and what you, what is coming in through your eyes, right? Because um, if we are too high in light exposure, and I, I like that you mentioned the red light because we do need more of the different colors of light throughout the day, you know, more blue enriched light during the morning, which is also important for helping to establish nightly melatonin synthesis and then more red hues at night. But the actual intensity of the light is also important to consider. And if people have light colored eyes, that is uh, another way to be looking at how we can change our melatonin status because people with light eyes, so light green, light blue, even light brown, if they're exposed to light at night, they can be more susceptible to the suppression of melatonin synthesis. Like in one study, it was about 17% suppressed just by the color of their eyes. So I think that, you know, as we think about light, we need to be thinking about darkness in equal proportions and how important that is. Are you self-employed or a small business owner and are tired of paying hundreds of dollars a month to centralize health insurance companies for minimal coverage because there is no alternative? Well, I have good news for you. There is. And this podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a more decentralized alternative to health insurance, and it uses community and crowdfunding to help its members pay for emergencies when they do happen. They incentivize and prioritize health and personal responsibility and share the thought that you should really only be using the centralized healthcare system when emergencies do happen. This is what I am on board with, and I have personally signed up for CrowdHealth since I left the corporate engineering world and the medical benefits that come with it. If you want to learn more, you can check out our episode with CEO and founder Andy Schoonover, or you can head over to joincrowdhealth.com and use code DRADIO, D-R-A-D-I-O, when you sign up to get a discounted rate of only $99 for the first three months. Centralized healthcare is one of the biggest issues in our society today, and I really love what CrowdHealth is doing to provide an alternative for people who care. I'm actually really glad you brought that up because that's sort of, we, we talk a lot about 
that that like light uh, function on the podcast. I do one. I do think like one thing that generally people don't talk about enough in the space, and I think they're beginning to is a lot of people do focus, at least in the quantum space, on that light during the day, getting proper light, making sure that you're not getting tons of artificial light, uh, especially at night before bed. But they also, like you said, it's critical to have this proper release to have like a really nice and dark room at night because when the sun's down, we really wouldn't, I mean, besides like artificial light, uh, air, like light pollution outside that we have now, it's super critical. And I uh, maybe we can kind of talk to, if you're familiar with the, the sensitivity of of like how sensitive our, our, our eyes are to light. I think, is that right, Tristan? We can sense to like like one photon or so, some ridiculously low number. We can like send some crazy light. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in general, for sure. And I think well, what's interesting just as a comment is is I've noted, I have blue eyes, right? So I have very light eyes. I'm definitely very sensitive. And, you know, yeah. it's just that that lower melanin content, right, in general, that's letting more light in. So I think that's important picture for for people to understand. So it's it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So I love that I'm talking with um, people that know about photons and light because I do feel like this is like next level medicine. This is really where medicine needs to go and is starting to go. So let me just give you some of the numbers here because I think it's important to, um, you, you talked about photons, but let's talk about lux. So lux is the unit of light. And so one lux is equal to a candle flame about three feet away, about a meter away. So what we know in... What we know from a candlelight is that that's a little bit more red in hue, and that has negligible suppressive effect on melatonin. So something like that warming light is not going to be as detrimental as something like an LED or other bulbs, which can suppress melatonin by over 50%. In fact, if I recall it correctly, one study showed that having 30 lux at night suppressed melatonin from the pineal gland by greater than 50%. So 30 lux at night, that's not too hard to get. You know, if you think of, um, you know, and I'm guilty of this, you know, some people go to the gym at night and they have all of those fluorescent lights and just think like, you know, you're trying to get healthy, but yet, you know, you're bombarded by this bright light that no doubt is 30 lux or greater. So how are people going to go to sleep after being in those environments at sporting events or they go to the store at night? So I, I do think we need to be looking at our exposure to light and be much more in rhythm with, with seasons. So what are the, um, the recommendations, right, for a healthy sleep environment? What you want is a maximum of one lux, believe it or not, <laughs> one lux of light in the bedroom or the sleeping room. You actually want zero lux if you can. Um, but it's actually not too difficult. You just have to measure it. If you don't measure it, then you won't change it. You won't actually know where you're at. So I think that, you know, for three hours before bedtime, try to stick with no more than 10 lux and try to minimize blue light. So one of the things that um, my husband is like into techie kind of things. And so he changed the light bulbs in our home. So we use the Philips, you did. <laughs> so we changed to the oh, yeah. You, I don't know if you know, but you know, we can do it through an app and like I, we can make purple lights, red lights, orange lights, you know, all kinds of different features. So, you know, there can be all kinds of ways to hack light in your environment, right? So what I would say is aim for minimal blue light, have dimmers, reduced intensity LED bulbs. We don't need all of these like high intensity LED bulbs. I think this is ruining ecosystems. You know, when you look from the, the, kind of the NASA type of um, photographs of the earth, you can see now that there's so much light at night when it needs to be really dark, right? So we don't need all of these high intensity bulbs. So another thing is um, I wanna talk about the daytime for a second, because even though we're talking about the darkness and nighttime, so right now in front of me, I'm sitting, I have rearranged my home office where I have a window to the outside in front of me. And I did that for ease, but also because I'm getting more light exposure. So when I take and measure with my app in front of me, I have on the order of like 5,000 lux during the day. Whereas if I was facing a wall, it would be like 200 lux, right? So if you go outside, that's going to average between 10 to 20,000 lux. 
So don't forget, again, I want the listeners to note, and you you brought it, you both brought it up, but it's equally important to get bright light exposure first thing in the morning. And that also helps with cortisol and testosterone, which are also high in those morning hours. And throughout the day, you also want to see if you can also maximize your light, your natural light by working in front of a window if you can. And then as it starts to get, I would say like 6 p.m., because what happens is you have what's called the dim light melatonin onset. As it becomes dimmer, dimmer, it goes up, the melatonin actually goes up with that dimness. So as it, so I would say just look to the environment. So seasonally speaking, we may need to be thinking about like winter versus summer. Now, another thing that came up that most people aren't aware of is that the moon cycle can influence melatonin levels endogenously. So what does that mean? There was a really neat study. There was only one study I could find, but I thought it was interesting because have you ever heard how many people will say during a full moon, how they don't sleep as well? And I often think, yeah, I mean, I've heard it. I've heard it from different people. I don't sometimes sleep as well. Um, But, and I often think, well, is it because it's just brighter outside? But this study was actually in a sleep lab. And what they showed was that for four days before and four days after a full moon, that the endogenous melatonin went down. It was decreased relative to other times of the month. So there may be personalized times of the year, times of the month. And then I think about women and their their menstrual cycle and how they sync with the moon, right? Um, there, I haven't found studies looking at those variables, but I think women need to be thinking about that for themselves in terms of personalizing perhaps supplemental melatonin to help with that. So I think a lot of things we need to think about when we personalize melatonin and, you know, age is one of the factors as well. So I was on a different podcast and, um, it was with Dr. Dick and Weatherby. And he said, you know, it's amazing because it sounds like we have what's called melatonin pause, you know how um, we have perimenopause, andropause, adrenopause, somatopause. Well, you know, if you think of all of the other hormones, melatonin kind of goes through that kind of that roller coaster. So, you know, kids produce the most amount of melatonin, like relative to other parts of the life cycle. And then as kids hit puberty, it starts to go down, 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 down. So by the time that you are in your mid 30s, your pineal gland is making something on the order of 0.3 milligrams. And then as you go into your 50s, you're making about 0.1 milligrams. And then you really start to tank from that point on. So age is a factor um, that plays into melatonin, which is why some people say, you know, just preventatively from an, uh, an aging and a longevity perspective that people start to take melatonin to make their mitochondria more fit and just to give them that added layer of protection um, as they do get older and less efficient at a lot of processes. Yeah, we'll definitely have to get into the supplement piece uh, at the end, but I think you mentioned just so many important things, right? The light environment, to me, uh, light is the main input signal to our biology. Um, It's driving so many biological processes and, you know, food, temperature, also very important, but light, probably number one and we've just become so disconnected with indoor living so yeah i mean ryan and i definitely if you probably come to our house after 7 p.m or 6 p.m it's all red it's you know (laughs) candles red light bulbs and lux is really important that's funny because i i've had that app for a while but i don't use it too often but it's good to get an idea and that's just um, it's a measure of brightness just to you know reiterate for people it's like how bright that light is or or concentration of photons i don't know exactly but it's um a big difference right because even if you have a red light and it's bright at nighttime you could technically be suppressing that melatonin so i think that's really a great goal for people to get below like 10 lux and zero at one. And I'm definitely going to monitor my room again tonight because it's, it's been a while and I've been reevaluating my, my work set up here too. Um, maybe something quickly before we get into, I mean, there's a few pieces. I want to get into the seasonality, but something as well. I talk a lot about EMFs from technology. So like Wi-Fi, cell phone radiation, which is also photonic. Um, this is non-visible light. 
Yeah. How much have you looked into how that suppresses melatonin? Because we recommend people turn their Wi-Fi off at night and get their cell phone out of the room to just, again, improve that melatonin production at nighttime. Yeah, there is some literature out there on um, EMFs changing melatonin synthesis. Um, you know, I haven't done a deep dive on it, but essentially, if we look on the other side of things, we see that melatonin can help with radiation exposure, which is another reason why some people choose to take it with certain um, approaches to cancer, you know, that it can finesse and help uh, in recovery of certain body systems. So I think that that's really interesting because, you know, I was telling you both that I just got back from Peru where I was at high altitude. So there can be times where we have more stress. If we're flying, we're subject to more radiation, especially midday. So we need to be thinking about our exposure to radiation, whether it's electromagnetic fields or a variety of different types of radiation. I think that melatonin can be useful for that. I think that the other thing I want to mention real quick before we move away from it and into the the supplements and all of that, and I think that this is a hot topic. In fact, I was just reading a paper yesterday on this, looking at the glymphatic fluid. I know that uh, most people are getting um, a a bit more savvy about what this is. So this is basically uh, the convection that happens around the brain while we sleep. And it only happens when we sleep or we're under anesthesia. So there's that exchange of metabolites that can happen when we're sleeping. So that cerebral spinal fluid and the interstitial fluid that comes together through the blood vessels, and we can get an emptying of things like toxic amyloid or even um, whether it's hyperphosphorylated tau proteins and such that can move out of the brain. There is some initial research, at least in animals, because it'd be difficult to do this in humans, that melatonin may be instrumental in the transport of those toxic metabolites. And this is actually uh, Dr. Ryder's work. He has an article where um, in the title, he talks about brainwashing, (laughs) but in a good way, like brainwashing through the melatonin, that melatonin might be instrumental in moving a number of those compounds out of the brain. And we know that buildup of things like amyloid and those tau proteins, those are hallmarks of amyloid, um, I'm sorry, of Alzheimer's disease, right? So there's that to consider. And um, also there's some newer work. I don't know if you're both into this, but um, there is some work on melatonin and its neuroprotective or its ability to grow nerves. And what I'm very interested in, especially as it relates to quantum science, is that I, I, you know, I would actually propose that melatonin is a molecule of consciousness. There was a study that showed that people who were long-term meditators, so we're talking like 10 or more years, had higher endogenous levels, just naturally, of melatonin compared to people who did not meditate. So it's kind of interesting if, uh, and it's even been proposed out there. Uh, There was one study that was talking about melatonin and serotonin, a lot of these aromatic type of structured compounds that, you know, they're light harnessers. So we can look at light through the lens of being a photon. We can also look at light in the way of consciousness and mental activity and neuronal plasticity. So I think that melatonin is one of those, I don't know if I would say a molecule as it relates to psychoneuroimmunology. It's kind of like the whole science of how we connect the mind to body. And I feel that melatonin is a beautiful bridge between the two because of its brain effects, these ones I'm describing and perhaps others. So I just thought I'd toss that out there because um, I don't always mention that on podcasts, but I'm getting more and more interested in it because, you know, for what we're trying to do is become more self-realized and actualized and conscious, you know, can there be certain compounds that are actually facilitating that process? Yeah. And and just quickly before Ryan jumps in, it's, it's really so important because it's kind of at first it seems like a fringe topic, but then you realize how connected it all is. And yeah, the aromatics, I mean, so many compounds with benzene rings, they're basically like photon traps and 
you can read how they interact with the bacteria in our gut. And then that's where, you know, so much melatonin is produced. Like we're really just scratching the surface and the, yeah, the pineal is called the third eye for a reason. And most of that is going into CSF. So uh, I love it. I think it's so great that this is kind of have has just a strong momentum behind it in terms of what actually is going on. And then, yeah, in terms of your consciousness and, and your environment and all the energy that's around is surrounding us is, is having a major effect on that. But um, yeah, I'll let, uh, I'll let Ryan chime in there for another question. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I actually really am glad that that you went that route, um, talking about sort of meditation, that mind-body connection piece. That's something that I've really been exploring really ever since I read the book, The Body Keeps the Score, which is like a very well-known right. book on, on various things. But it, it really opened my eyes to the possibilities as I was going through my own journey of my mental state being a reflection of my environment and then my physical state being a reflection of those two pieces together. And I yeah. think it really changes, like you were saying, like the future of like medical uh, intervention is going to be really interesting as we take some of these thoughts, hopefully, into account. Um, because I think there's so many systemic pervasive problems that while we like to micromanage every diagnosis or term, we're really beginning to see the plethora of, of in, environmental involvement across the board. And especially with that mental piece, I, I, I was reading um, some things uh, related to things like autism, ADHD, um, mm -hmm. things like that. And there's very interesting science around um, melatonin involvement uh, for, for those people. But I, I think about anyone that suffers from some sort of psychiatric illness, whether it's bipolar disorder, BPD, um, just generalized anxiety. Um, a lot of these things have very overlapping arched uh, things with environmental uh, changes. And my mother's a school teacher. I, I bring this up on the podcast fairly often, but she teaches kindergarten and first grade, has taught for 35 years. And I, I'll ask her every now and then as I've gotten into this stuff, like what have, what cha have you seen changes in children's psychology over the years since you began teaching in like the late 80s, early 90s. And she will tell me that the amount of kids with anxiety or just diagnosed uh, psychiatric illnesses beyond ADHD, um, but like things like uh, there's a certain defiance disorder that she's had kids with is just staggering. And yeah. and it, it really begs the question like, okay, are we looking at the right things? Like is, yeah. are, are, is giving them Adderall fixing the problem? Or are we just perpetuating the environmental discourse, you know? And so it's really interesting getting into sort of the psychology, psychological effects of of all the stuff that we've been talking about with with melatonin um, suppression uh, or inability to to synthesize correctly. Um, so I'm sure you've, I mean, you've written a whole bunch about it. That's that was a piece of your paper that we we're reading that I was like super excited about. Um, what was that section? So I kind of wanted to ask you just a little bit about that. But I also want to get to right after that. Um, around supplementation, some of the yeah. efficacy and, and stuff like that, but we'll get to there. Wow. You, you said so many great things. That yeah, I, sorry. I, I tend to like go off. Tangent. No, it's all, it, it's so interesting, isn't it? And one of the things that comes to my mind just more intuitively as you're speaking about it is I do think that it's really important to focus on gut health. In fact, I just posted on my Facebook page yesterday this um, graphic of a Venn diagram of the neuroendocrine system and the gastroimmune system. It's kind of like they overlap and like we really need to tend to when I think of these kids that your mom is working with, it's kind of like you know, the gut microbiome even has a circadian rhythm. Like the gut microbiome is producing these metabolites that are going and signaling the brain. I feel that, you know, stress, inflammation, and diet, these three are so pivotal for priming the gut. And the gut, being that it's a main producer of melatonin, even if it's used just locally or like somewhat locally, it's still important. And it's also a, a huge harnesser of other neurotransmitters and hormones. So hormones determine behavior, just like neurotransmitters. So, you know, everything you're saying, it makes total sense. And if you look at the literature, if we, if we just chunk out in boxes of like all of the clinical uses of melatonin, because we're going to talk about supplementation. And before we even talk about supplementation, I think that we should first talk about like, what would you do from a nutrition 
Well, how would you even know if you needed melatonin, right? Like these kids with ADHD or autism, you know, I'm not a huge advocate of all of these kids just popping melatonin gummies and chewables. I mean, I was just on a podcast yesterday and she was, the woman interviewing me was talking about how, you know, she has seen kids taking uh, 10 milligrams of melatonin in a gummy format. You know, I just don't think that that's, that's the best practice. That's not like the first line of where I would go. But just to back up to your point about, you know, just thinking of the brain, depression, mood disorders, there's a case to be made for looking at the role of melatonin in the central nervous system. I mean, first and foremost, central rhythm, you know, the circadian rhythm modulation, we need to think about that because it runs so much. Um, Sleep-wake disorders, you know, thinking about people who have shift work, and have flip-flopped the day-night, there's a reason for melatonin supplementation there too. And they're at greater risk of metabolic conditions as well as certain kinds of cancers. You know, people that have a sleep disturbance, I would say, you know, we need to look at the root cause. You know, is it toxicity? Is it sleep hygiene? There can be a lot of different things, cognitive issues, migraines, headaches, behavioral issues. And there is a case to be made. So even though I just waxed on kids not taking melatonin, especially high doses in that gummy format, I think that there can be a case to be made for kids with certain conditions like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and even things like autistic spectrum disorder. There is some literature to suggest that supplemental melatonin may help these kids. I don't know how it is helping them mechanistically specifically, like is it changing the gut microbiome and then that's changing the brain interface, or is it something else, you know? But anyway, there, there can be something there. And you know, the other thing is eye disorders. I, I can't tell you how many people talk about retinal detachment, eye disorders, corneal dysfunctions. And I don't know if it's because of all of the exposure now to artificial blue light. And I wonder about the kids that your mom is now teaching because their exposure to technology is coming earlier in their lives. And now it'll be for a greater proportion. Do they need to be looking at melatonin? Do they need to be wearing certain glasses? So all of that, I think it's uh, really relevant. I think that there's a case to be made for cardiovascular indications, reproductive health, um, the gastrointestinal system. I think this is probably one of the more intriguing ones. And of course, the one that we started with, which was the immune system. You know, certain parts of the immune system are actually regulated through melatonin. And if you've looked at Russell Ryder's work, you probably have looked at Doris Lowe's research, which which talks about the use of melatonin in liquid-liquid phase separation or looking at viral replication. So one of the things that viruses do within cells is they kind of uh, play by themselves. They they set up in a non-membrane way, a little factory. And this doesn't have a membrane. This is like, it's it's like creating some kind of a phase within the cell. And what melatonin seems to do is to break that factory up and to like stop that from happening and to help the mitochondria to work better and also to prevent that kind of phase separation that can occur with viruses and also with amyloid and, and other things. So... I think that, you know, there there can be a reason to supplement with melatonin. And I think that much like other supplements, it's all about the quality and also about potentiating the type of melatonin. Like back in the day, the way that we had melatonin supplements was to take the pineal gland of animals and extract it. Like that is so inefficient, right? So like, first of all, we it, it just doesn't make sense to be having all of those animals and procuring because the amount of melatonin is so minute, right? So what ended up happening was that there have been commercial processes to streamline the production of melatonin, to make it cheaper, to make it faster. So many times this process, if you look at a lot of the patents, they start with something like, you know, a petroleum-based substance, or if it's a plant-based substance, you know, like a corn or a soy derivative, And then they kind of run it through a series of chemical reactions. Well, there was a study published, I think it was 2018. This wasn't my work, this is somebody else. And essentially it was looking at all the different kinds of melatonin and it was talking about 13 different potential contaminants found by way of this chemical processing. 
So I think that we need to be asking questions about the type of melatonin that we're taking because we don't want residual uh, amounts of these contaminants, whether it's thalamide derivatives, um, different kinds of uh, tryptophan and, and other types of serotonin derivatives that may not be good. So that's what kind of led me into this plant melatonin, which is uh, called herbatonin. So it is from rice, alfalfa, and um, uh, chlorella. So it's all green. If you look at the little capsule, it's just like green powder. So there was um, essentially a study in which the researchers, and again, this is not my work, this was published in the Molecules Journal in 2021. And so they took synthetic melatonin versus this herbatonin, which again, the plant melatonin, and they compared it side by side in a number of different assays. And they found that the herbatonin was 646% greater in its anti-inflammatory activity. And it was up to 470% greater in its ability to, to scavenge free radicals, which is just phenomenal because we already know that melatonin is great at doing both of those things, at being anti-inflammatory and scavenging free radicals. However, there's something more about that concentrate of the plant where it's been naturally produced by the plant and it has other things in it like you know, even compounds for blue light, like lutein and zeaxanthin and uh, different types of nutrients that are also in that herbatonin that just naturally occur in the plant. So anyway, that that is, uh, I would say, if you're going to take a, a supplement of melatonin, you need to be asking all of the hard questions, like what is the source of it? How is it derived? Um, what is the dose? And perhaps you want to talk a little bit about the dose that people need to be thinking about, because I think that people have gone into like high, high levels, kind of like this thinking of like, okay, if a little is good, then more is better. And I don't necessarily think that that is the case with melatonin, especially if we're using it at night before sleep. If you're a health conscious food consumer, who's also very active, you know how big of a struggle it is to find a bar that is both convenient and nutrient dense. That's why I was so excited when I discovered the Alpa Bar. The Alpa Bar is a meat-based bar that contains only simple ingredients, 100% grass-fed beef, tallow, and honey, and is both nutrient-dense and convenient and packs a caloric punch of over 300 calories. For me, this was a game changer and is now the go-to snack and fuel source I use when I'm hiking, camping, hunting, skiing, or doing anything in the outdoors, and I don't have the resources to cook a full meal. The Alpa Bar is made proudly in Colorado and only uses locally sourced meat. JJ and Rob are also extremely based and accept Bitcoin for payment. I highly recommend you check out the Alpa Bar for any time you need a nutrient-dense and convenient snack on the go. Check them out at Eat alpha.com and use code DRADIO5 at checkout to get a 5% discount. And if you pay in Bitcoin, you can get an additional discount on top of that. That's eataupa.com and use code DRADIO5 at checkout. Yeah. Uh, well, you covered it pretty well there. I think it's really, this is so important and I've written extensively about this topic. Um, I think overall supplementing with synthetic melatonin is like a pretty bad idea because most people, they don't understand the dosage. Yeah. Like you said, the quality is garbage. The dosing of the supplement itself is usually wrong to what the label says. Um, it has other things in it, as you mentioned. And yeah, it's a synthetic compound. So when you put it head to head with um, a more natural form of melatonin, um, yeah, I, I read about that too. They used to extract it from like pig pineal glands, which is actually kind of cool, but yeah, very inefficient. I'm sure it was more accurate and more, you know, functioning better back then when they did that compared to being produced in a lab. And I'm curious to get your thoughts maybe on why that is. Um, but first, I think people need to realize that this is not really solving the root cause of, of your issues. If you're older, you know, or you have cancer, things like that, you know, these are completely different scenarios, but we are talking yeah. about the children, you know, with blue lit, blue lit screens all day long. They wonder why they can't sleep. They just have all this stimulation at nighttime, you know, giving them a 10 MG gummy 
is just idiotic. I, I It's crazy to me that this is happening when I think based on your paper, right, it's it's a bit of a big range, but it's like, you know, 0.1 to 0.89 milligrams. And again, that'll depend on, on age. So what I, you know, I kind of knew this for a while and I don't, I don't really supplement with melatonin at all anymore. Um, again, I think it's really, you know, like you said, if you have those extreme circumstances, maybe if you're flying across the world and you want to just take a nibble on one for like the one day that you're transitioning time zones, you know, that could be helpful. But the, like all the supplements are like five milligrams, three milligrams, you know, some as high as 10. And I, I was having, you know, three years ago to like cut them in half and then just take like a tiny, tiny nibble when I would, you know, fly to Europe or something for one day. And it, it was just crazy. So it's, it's just a wild way to try and take a pill to solve your problem. But I want to get back to the point of the phytomelatonin compared to the synthetic because we've had uh, Dr. Stephanie Seneff on the podcast and yeah. we talked about deuterium and she's very anti supplements because she thinks that all the methyl acetyl groups, they're all going to be, uh, you know, higher in deuterium. Uh, you know, which is heavy hydrogen, and that's going to cause issues in our biology. And probably, I think there, when I saw your paper, I was like, well, we have a natural form of melatonin made in, in nature compared to something made in the lab. I think the deuterium content of the hydrogens in the melatonin would be way higher in what's made in the lab compared to the plant melatonin. So I, I, I think that could be a potential mechanism based on her research. So I'm, I'm curious if you looked into that or you have any other ideas besides maybe some of those cofactors that you mentioned, like the carotenoids? Yeah, well, and I think, um, you know, you brought up a couple of great points there, right? I mean, I don't know about the deuterium level and all of that, but being that the plant melatonin is directly derived from the plants and the way that the plants are grown are in a way that they are optimized for their production of melatonin and they're harvested at the time where melatonin would be high. So I, I think that there are growing cultivation practices which are harmonized to natural rhythms and don't require the synthetic overlay, which can bring in all of these different chemicals, which, you know, to her point, we just don't know what those things are doing to the gut microbiome. Her work, she's done a lot of great work on glyphosate, the gut microbiome, and a lot of that. So, you know, I think about a lot of these synthetic compounds and especially as you mentioned like at higher doses that we might not actually see on the label we we don't know what we're actually getting so i i think so since both of you have done your homework and you've looked at the article one of the things in the article that i show at the very end is a triangle and at the base of the triangle like if we're just thinking about optimizing melatonin right like i wouldn't say to jump to a melatonin supplement like that wouldn't be for everybody right off the bat what I would say is at the base of this triangle, like what can most people do that is even free? It will even save them money. And that is to get your light right. Like, can you imagine like the energy savings that people would just to turn down some of their electricity at night? I mean, it's like actually benefiting them, the planet, their finances, everything. So get your light right and get your darkness right. So wearing the blue light blocking glasses actually can work. And I think for people who can't get darkness, uh, that yes, you've got them. <laughs> I've got mine too. I've got a couple of pair actually, different shades at different times and all of that. Um, but then I think, yeah, then we start to look at bringing in those blue light blocking glasses, getting in the red light. Then I think we work our way up from that and we start to look at our diet. You know, me, I'm a nutrition scientist by training. So of course I'm going to say this getting adequate protein with tryptophan, adequate tryptophan, which is a harness. I mean, gosh, we didn't even talk about this, but there is this whole pathway of tryptophan going through the kynorenin pathway. So when we're stressed or we need energy, NAD, tryptophan is huge for running that cycle. 95% of tryptophan actually goes into energy production. And if we are running this over and over again, and there's a lot of stress in the body, we can actually start to make some neurotoxic compounds. Only about 5% of the tryptophan that we take in is used to create endogenous melatonin. So making sure that we get adequate amounts of tryptophan. 
And what's, what's interesting there is that you also need a number of different nutrients to create the tryptophan to serotonin to melatonin. So if you have methylation issues, you know, you'd have to override some of that with magnesium and B vitamins. So anyway, I think it's important to get adequate tryptophan and to be, to enable your body to, to use it best. So that's the other level. And then up from that, I would say, take care of your eyes and you can do that through carotenoids. My whole graduate research was on carotenoids, which are the plant compounds There are about 700 of them. And certain ones of them, like lutein and zeaxanthin, they embed into the macula, which can protect us from artificial blue light and can also protect us against other types of conditions. We see associations between things like age-related macular degeneration and concentration of lutein zeaxanthin in that macula. They're actually really cool compounds. If you look at their structure, they look like fatty acids, but they're a little bit more... Um, uh, a little bit more water soluble. So they have some fluidity in the eye. And so they're able to protect the eye from light. So be thinking of getting adequate plants in the diet in order to get those carotenoids. Have you looked into DHA at all in like a similar type role? Because I, I've talked to Michael Crawford as well. And yeah, the vitamin A photoreceptor and then the carotenoids and then there's the DHA piece. So I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think that they all work as a, a team, quite honestly. They all have very similar structures. And DHA is, is definitely found in the eye. You know, the eye is an interesting place because it's liquid but solid. Mm -hmm. And that vitreous humor in the middle of the eye, what makes it like a jelly, it needs to be fluid enough that light goes through. So you need the right proportions of things like the carotenoids and the fatty acids. In fact, the eye is so, if we just go to the retina for a second, we go to the macula, we go to the fovea, which is in the middle, there are very distinct ratios of those carotenoids in those respective parts that the body just does automatically. So I'm assuming that with the fatty acids, there is a similar, my, my PhD was actually on essential fatty acids. I didn't study the eye per se, but I just know that the body is very smart. It's very intelligent about how it's placing, you know, certain ratios of certain things in certain places for that function. So I would think that there would be that nice ratio between those two. So yeah, I'm glad that you brought up the fatty acids as well, because that's also something we need to be bringing in for adequate eye function and also to reduce inflammation, right? So after we've done all of that, then we bring in a supplemental plant melatonin. <laughs> you know, okay, let me just tell you personally, I'm 53. I just turned 53. And um, what I know about the melatonin curve is that, you know, endogenously, especially I'm, I'm just recently um, menopausal. So we know that menopausal women, you know, dealing with sleep disturbance, one of the things we didn't talk about, but melatonin actually can re regulate body temperature. So when does body temperature go awry at night, you know, typically, especially in older people. And so, you know how you get kind of chilled before bedtime? I don't know. If, yeah. So you kind of feel like it's time to put on my pajamas, right? I feel like that's kind of the melatonin. It's the, the hypothermic effect that enables us to sleep. So when women get that thermo dysregulation, you know, kind of looking at all of the things that melatonin is good for, looking at the time of life, looking at gender looking at, you know, what you're doing, you know, you mentioned travel, travel is when I would definitely take a, like a three milligram dose of herbitonin versus what I take on a normal everyday maintenance dose, which is 0 0.3 milligrams. You know, in fact, there was just a great article in the Townsend letter from Dr. Pam Smith. And she was also talking about low dose melatonin, you know, under one milligram. So I take a maintenance dose just to bring me back to what I had in middle age. So I take that 0 0.3 milligrams, you know, it's teeny tiny. And it just helps to kind of like, the way I think of it is it like fills the gap. It's not like I'm amplifying unless I'm tra traveling where I'm subject to high altitude, I'm in a plane with high radiation, then yeah, I'm gonna take between three to six milligrams. I'm gonna do it three days before I travel. I'm gonna do it three days on site at my new location. So that's just more of an acute thing. So that that's just what I do. And of course I take all of the other precautions of, 
you know, looking at the Lux in my room, wearing those blue light blocking glasses. You know, there was a cool study on blue light blocking glasses actually showing that when people wore them two to three hours before bed for one month, they had improvements in their fasting plasma glucose levels. So there's even, I mean, isn't that neat that there would be like this blood sugar lowering effect? We wouldn't think that the glasses would have all of that interrelationship, but if you can go inside of that mechanistically, if melatonin and cortisol are like brother and sister on opposite ends of that, you know, that day rhythm, and you're modifying your melatonin, which means you're favorably modifying the cortisol, right? Just like when you change cortisol and you have more stress, you're going to be changing now your melatonin. It's like a seesaw. And the other seesaw that we didn't perhaps get to is vitamin D and melatonin. And then in fact, that was like the whole basis for the article that I see vitamin D and melatonin as circadian nutrients. You know, they're not even just hormones. They're not even just antioxidants. I think we need them. You know, they, they become lower with age and we need them. And they have a lot of similarities. And in fact, there was a neat study showing, um, I think this was just in women. And what they showed was that women that were vitamin D deficient or insufficient, they had changed levels of melatonin. So like melatonin levels were synced to the vitamin D. So in nutrition, one of the things that I've learned is that it's all about relationship. It's never just about the DHA by itself. It's never just about vitamin D by itself. It's like, what is that nutrient in relationship to the other nutrient and how is it changing it? So if we can correct our vitamin D and get that back on track, right, then we can help to modify and help to regulate melatonin. And I would bring magnesium into that. Like I've actually drawn a triangle, like when I'm teaching on sleep, you know, it's vitamin D, melatonin and magnesium. And magnesium is required, not just for muscle relaxation and, you know, all of the benefits of magnesium, like the hundreds of reactions, but also for the hydroxylase enzymes that help to activate the vitamin D. And we also need the magnesium to help to activate the tryptophan to move into melatonin. So a lot of different biochemical, you know, I, I love this conversation with you because with you both, because I don't often get to talk about the quantum, the consciousness, the science, the nutrients. And I feel like we covered a lot of ground in this one. If you're a health conscious food consumer, who's also very active, you know how big of a struggle it is to find a bar that is both convenient and nutrient dense. That's why I was so excited when I discovered the Alpa bar. The Alpa bar is a meat-based bar that contains only simple ingredients, 100% grass-fed beef, tallow, and honey, and is both nutrient dense and convenient and packs a caloric punch of over 300 calories. For me, this was a game changer and is now the go-to snack and fuel source I use when I'm hiking, camping, hunting, skiing, or doing anything in the outdoors and I don't have the resources to cook a full meal. The Alpa Bar is made proudly in Colorado and only uses locally sourced meat. JJ and Rob are also extremely based and accept Bitcoin for payment. I highly recommend you check out the Alpa Bar for any time you need a nutrient-dense and convenient snack on the go. Check them out at Eat alpha.com and use code DRADIO5 at checkout to get a 5% discount. And if you pay in Bitcoin, you can get an additional discount on top of that. That's eataupa.com and use code DRADIO5 at checkout. Yeah, yeah. And I think we could probably talk for three more hours. So it's tough. You know, that's always a struggle. But I really appreciate the pyramid like in the paper. I actually forgot that that was all the way at the end because I, I read this originally when we first reached out a few months back. But yeah. it's really taking a lifestyle first approach. And it's fantastic now that there is a better version to supplement because, yeah, we talked about the synthetic stuff really, really is garbage. But maybe just one last question on the vitamin D relationship, because I think obviously that is the crux of the paper. You talk about how melatonin can also bind to the vitamin D receptors. I'm really big on seasonality, uh, especially I live in Wyoming in the winter. You know, I really embrace local diet and, you know, the light cycles. So yeah, what, what happens in winter, in my opinion, is melatonin becomes, you know, this dominant hormone and vitamin D, obviously we have this seasonal depression. So I try and embrace that, you know, maybe you do sleep more, 
And that's why I also think like supplementing vitamin D in the winters is, is really like a foolish thing because it's again giving your body kind of a wrong input signal. But we live in this world where people don't get enough sun in the wind in the summer to build up those stores. So maybe I'm just curious on your opinion on the seasonality component of melatonin and these hormones. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, you know, it's hard to say with supplementation. I think like again, measuring levels just to see where people are at, looking at symptoms to determine whether or not more intervention is required, right? But I'm I'm right there with you. I do think that seasons tell us a lot. So if we're in the darkness more, it's just that many people, just like you said, they don't honor the darkness in the winter. They just do more artificial blue light. So their melatonin could actually be tanking in the winter because they're not honoring the natural rhythms. You know, I, I was... You, pro- you both probably know about this because you're really savvy, but there's a trend now to do darkness retreats where people actually go for like extended periods of like not being in light at all. And in fact, I was just listening to a podcast with uh, Deepak Chopra and he was talking about in Ayurveda, they talk about going into darkness for like months at a time and you like you rejuvenate your whole body. Like the aspect of darkness, I hope that we leave everybody thinking about this, that people truly have a darkness deficiency. And I love what you're saying about honoring the rhythms of nature. Like, let us be in the darkness when it's winter. Let us be in the light a bit more when it's summer, right? Now, the the other way that I think we can prime our behaviors and our lifestyle is through food. Food actually has certain polyphenols. And like you said, the light capturing photonic sensing compounds like polyphenols and um, different other things that help to prime the hypothalamic junction to enable us to work better seasonally. But what have we done? We eat oranges in the winter. We signal summer to the body when it's actually winter. So we get different metabolic messages from that. So I think, you know, just to bring it back to even this trip that I took to Peru, one of the things I saw with Peruvian people is like, and even the ancient ways in Peru, is like people honored nature. They were in sync with nature. They were living outside a bit more than we are, a lot more. They were growing things. Even when I look at their corn, their potatoes, you know, in the States, we have disdain for those foods. But when I look at those foods in Peru, they're all different colors different colors of maca, like black maca, red maca, red quinoa, black quinoa. These are like high polyphenol circadian nutrient foods. These foods put them in harmony with the seasons and with nature. So like you, I I feel like let's get back on track. Let's honor nature. Let's, um, you know, I think we, we try to like hack our environment so we can just do these dysfunctional things. But I think that really and truly, it just requires us getting back into basics and living in a way that is harmonized. So it sounds like a similar company here. (laughs) I'm so happy you said the oranges in the winter thing, because it's just, it's crazy how disconnected that we have become in this modern world we live in. You know, 150 years ago, even you didn't have to tell people to watch a sunrise and have a dark, you know, room that they sleep in at night. That's just what happened. But we've just become more disconnected than ever. And really melatonin is such an important compound. And the more you learn about it, the more you realize that and it's everywhere as we've talked about. So thank you so much, Dana, for coming on. It's been a pleasure. We'll have to do this again sometime in the future, but where can people find more about your work, um, supplement company and anywhere else you want to point them towards? Yeah, if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me at deanna.minick at symphonynaturalhealth.com. Symphony Natural Health is the company with the Herbitonin. So there are two doses, that 0.3 and the three milligrams. And they have other products as well that I think are super cool. I wouldn't work with them otherwise. So, um, but then otherwise, uh, you know, you can find me on Instagram, my Facebook, uh, all under my name. And also I have my own website, deannaminick.com, D-E-A-N-N-A-M-I-N-I-C-H.com. So lovely to be here with you both. Thank you for the conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much. We appreciate you coming on and yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time. All right. All right. We just wrapped up with Dr. Deanna Minnick on melatonin. 
That was a fascinating conversation, Ryan. Um, I think we're a little limited on time. You know, we could talk about melatonin for probably six hours and <laughs> yeah. there was just a lot to cover there, but I think she did a good job. No, she did really well. I mean, she talked a lot and I was totally fine with, with like 99% of it. And I really like the fact that she brought into the main message that I think really came out for me was connection. Like all of these things are connected to so many things. We need to stop really looking at everything in isolation and really ha- look at how things connect from like just a natural perspective. And so many of the answers, like we're just like outside your window the whole time and taking away the idea of like all these comfortable things that we've become accustomed to, like lighting at night and really readjusting our priorities. Really, my big takeaway was like, we got to readjust our priorities. Like if you want to feel good and you feel like shit, you got to change things. You're not going to supplement melatonin out of the way to fix it. You got to change stuff and be okay with everyone else maybe thinking you're a little weird, you know? Hundred percent. And yeah, honestly, when they first reached out, I think the the company slid in my Twitter DMs is how I found out about it. And I was a little skeptical. But after reading the paper and you definitely after talking to her today, she's such a wealth of knowledge. It's really, you know, lifestyle first approach. Uh, and it's awesome to see how many more researchers, how many more MDs and everyone are coming on board that light and circadian health is is tremendously important. And again, I'm still not a huge fan of the supplements, but it is, as we talked about, like the synthetic supplements are atrocious. So if there's actually just like a better alternative, you know, for those instances where you, you know, might need it, you know, maybe you have cancer, maybe you're a night shift worker, maybe you're 75 years old, it might make sense for you. And at least you have an option now that is better than a synthetic compound that's probably extremely rich in deuterium fillers, the wrong dosing and the whole the whole shebang. So um, it's cool. I, and I think it also shows, you know, a lot of this research is kind of just on the frontier. Like we're, we're just kind of scratching the surface and, you know, there's some questions there and we'll have to definitely get Russell Ryder or oh, yeah. Scott Zimmerman on, I think Russell Ryder would be fantastic because like the mitochondrial synthesized melatonin, they don't even really, really know exactly mm-hmm. how all this is happening. Same with the gut microbiome melatonin. It's, yeah, that's, it's that's really insane. brand, it's brand new. We just don't know. Yeah. I think that's part of the thing too, is like being okay, not knowing everything and sort of just taking a stab. But at the end of the day, it's like, we say it all the time. If you return to nature and make that the priority of your life, shit's going to happen for you. And there's no way around it. There's no way around it. And the seasonality thing. I was yep. so happy. She that said, was great. Yeah, I was blown in- away. She talked when she mentioned the orange. I was like, man, I I see Tristan lighting up. I see the light bulb going off. It's great. Well, it's just wild to me because you know it's so simple in context, right? Like if in winter time there's less light, melatonin will be elevated. You know, it's colder. All these things are upregulating your your uncoupling proteins. You're a, your body's ability to produce heat and you you want to give it all the right input signals. Our bodies are so able to adapt to the environment we're in. We just have to tell it what to do. And if we just give it all the wrong input signals, it's not going to be doing well in any environment. And yeah, it's definitely made me, uh, I'm even going to rearrange maybe my office setup here in terms of the lux during the day. It's, it's really a challenge even. And I have a bunch of windows in my area here, but it really isn't bright enough. And then same thing at nighttime, the darkness is, is so important. I almost have the trade off between like corners of my bedroom that are darker and then lower EMF. So I'm glad she, she acknowledged that as well. Cause people EMFs are photons as well from technology. So this is also going to disrupt melatonin production. So really that sleep sanctuary, we've talked about it on so many podcasts, your bedroom, your sleep environment is so important and it's spot on, you know, turn all the lights off in your house, wear dark red blue light blockers for an hour before you go to sleep. I guarantee you will pass out and have the best night sleep in your life. Yeah. And the other thing that was really interesting to me, and you brought it up about the seasonality was that idea of everybody's really into supplementing vitamin D because they know they're not getting enough sunlight or they think they can't get it through sunlight. I've had many conversations with pretty health savvy people that 
don't really understand the mechanism of how EMF can be a detriment to even their synthesis of vitamin D. And that's why they may actually be having issues synthesizing it at all in the first place. And so they think they need to be supplementing this like crazy amounts of IUs all year round. But you brought up that really important point of like, maybe in the winter, we really got to let melatonin take ahead. But if we're screwed on both sides, we're just in a dump truck of crap because we can never get ahead. And so that's why it's like, it sounds like we're saying you got to do all this stuff, but you got to kind of take it into account because it's, there's not a silver bullet here. It's, it's about taking all those precautions and being just cognizant of your surroundings. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a fan of vitamin D3 supplementation at all. Um, you're not even getting, it's not even close to an no. equivalent. Like at least with the melatonin, the phytomelatonin, the plant melatonin, it's like pretty close. Well, and uh, people think that vitamin D is the only thing that you need to be getting from yeah, sunlight when it, you're getting it, all these other signals. Well, yeah, and it's just, it's not even the same vitamin D. It's completely different. So yeah, people just need to realize that supplements are not solving any of their problems. It might be like a short-term band-aid. And again, we talked about that with the melatonin. Um, well, we talked about methylation too. And like people yeah. think that they can out supplement methylation issues when there's so much more tied to that, that I can't even get into it with people. But yeah, and hopefully by the time this podcast is out, I actually meant we should email her that paper from uh, Michael Crawford. And, and oh, hopefully by the time this is out, our second episode with Michael Crawford is out that goes deep into the uh, DHA visual um, transduction rabbit hole. Because really the eye, I mean, the photoreceptors in the eye, I'm glad she harped on that. Mm -hmm. DHA, rhodopsin, vitamin A, the carotenoids, which, you know, are kind of in that vitamin A realm. It's it's so important and the biological semiconduction going on there is, is really fun stuff. But I think this is a great rip. We'll definitely have to do more on melatonin in the future. Um, let us know what you think in the comments. And as always, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.